Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 13, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week. Eh, yeah, I think by the time we get done with it all, I'll still have a lot to cover, so uh, I better go ahead and get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this free endorsement. Let's go be out there. Give me a shout out. Monster, it's been a while since we shorted you guys. Let's be friends. And Red Bull said I was too fat. Thank you, Red Bull. Forget you. All right. Hang on. My headset's tangled here. Ah. Getting old. All right. Um, there's a claim screen. Let me give you the short version. Oh, the short version's missing. Um, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. Throw me a bone. Looks like we picked up another review this week, so thank you so much. Um, if you don't mind, uh, put me up a review on Amazon.com, even if you agree with everyone else. I get a couple stinkers every now and then that mean absolutely nothing um, because they either didn't read the book or they're just reviewing other reviews, which is completely stupid. I have no idea why someone would do these things. But anyway, the good uh, seems to balance out the bad overwhelmingly, but, you know, it doesn't hurt to have another one. Could never have enough, right? So, throw me a bone, do me a favor, put me a review on Amazon.com. Um, what are we going to talk about? Well, there's a couple things I want to talk about today, and one's pretty simple. It's um, changing hats, and that's going from a, a trader to a trend follower once a position begins to move in your favor. It's a fairly simple concept, but it's also very important in that I think that, not that it's a secret to the methodology, but as I've said before, and without getting into ego, uh, one thing that, that's been nice to have confirmed by Brainiacs and PhDs, etc., is that something that I thought was simple and everyone knew, not everyone knows, about how to transition from that shorter-term trader to a longer-term trader. And when it comes to markets, no matter what anybody claims or thinks or says, you really only can predict the short term. But that doesn't mean you can't stick around longer term. So I'm going to kind of rehash a little bit of that. I want to talk about planning, too. It seems like there's just a an incredible amount of people who simply don't plan before going into a trade and that's going to make a lot of more sense once we get to it. You often hear me talk about changing hats, going from the trader to the trend follower. In an ideal world we'd just be trend followers the problem is we don't know if that short-term trade is going to turn into a longer-term trend. So let's take a look at a couple of open positions, and let's look at how we turn from a trader to a trend follower. This one triggered here. We had a stop about right here. And it rallied up a little bit in here. You can see that what we did was we brought our stop up pretty much lockstep. And then it went sideways for a while. But when it began to rally again to get to that profit target, we began to accelerate our stop higher, too. At this point, we're still sort of in trader mode. We have a tr transitioned over to trend follower. And we get our stop up to about break even once, that, once it hits break even. Now, once we're at this juncture, we're able to, I hate to use relax, because it's like you're never really relaxed. But the, for me, it's relaxing. Um, once I'm in a big winner, I don't worry about it anymore. And I know it's kind of a strange thing, but it seems like some of these big winners, they just keep going and going and going. And you just come in, not every day, but most days and in general, they tend to go up. And you just stick with them. Um, I used to be less patient and want to try to get out at the exact top. And now, and I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes again, too. It's like the pressure's off. I just let it go and see what happens. Life becomes a lot easier, not necessarily more exciting. In fact, less exciting, as we'll see here in a minute. But it takes the pressure off of you, and it's much easier to follow along. So once we get that initial profit target out, 
that stop it comes from way down here and it makes a jump all the way up to here okay and we ratchet it higher as it moves in our favor but then it gets up to break even once we have hit that initial profit target now barring overnight gaps the worst we could do is what I call the poke in the eye trade you make one percent overall in a trade and you make zero percent on a remainder okay so one percent especially if it happens over a couple of weeks time frame as I'll rehash here in just one minute can be a pretty darn good trade annualized if you could do that enough but that's still not where the real money is even though you do fantastic the real money is in the longer term trend following and as you can see the initial profit target on this one was I think right around here or so so at this juncture here we're at break even so the worst we could do is break even but the good news is as this position continues to move in our favor even if we stop out we're still going to be at a profit now it was kind of interesting I read a book not too long ago well I guess it's been probably a year or so now to think about it but uh, I read Curtis Faith's book uh, he wrote one of the turtle books and I haven't read the other ones I just haven't gotten around to doing it but there were some interesting things and comments that were that were they were talking about in the um, Faith's book and it's on my website somewhere uh, that just things like they had a ping pong table and they became really good at ping pong because there was a lot of times where there where there wasn't anything to do and they started playing ping pong while waiting for the markets which is which is brilliant but the one thing that I that I got out of the book which I thought was cool is that when Dennis and um, was it Eckhart taught them the system they they treated open losses to profits differently than open losses so it's okay to give up some of those open loss open profits and you shouldn't worry about that and, and when I say treating I'm talking about the way they looked at drawdown so if your equity curve looks like this and then you get a little bit of a drawdown in there I guess that's not as bad as this, and then you had that, okay? So this is okay, whereas this is uh, somewhat concerning when it comes to trading. So you have to be willing to give up some of those open profits. And you've seen me before, and I didn't put the chart in today, but you see the chart where I show a 25% gain on a stock, and then maybe like 12, and then 50, and then maybe like 30, and then 100 and then 75, and then 200, and then 150, okay, where the stock does this, okay, and so you have to be willing to give up some of those open profits, and that's just life, and that's just longer term trend following, so we only know the short term when we come into the market, or we can only predict the short term, so this stock pulled back, and it was break it out, we had a bow tie back here, or wherever, it looked like it had the potential, at least over the short term, to continue higher over the next week or two. And that's why we took the position. Now, our stop looked like this here. But now the stop looks like this here. You can see it's much bigger. So if you're doing these like sideways Vs, it looks like that to that. So you trans um, it gets transformed, he tried to say from this shorter term stop that looks like this to this longer term stop that looks like this now in case you're wondering if you do the methodology why not just start with a big stop like this well you could but the problem is and if you're going for the longer term trend this this move here is fairly uncertain we don't know if that's going to materialize or not and if you do go after those long term trends and use those big stops etc you're going to have some really really ugly drawdowns and you're going to be wrong a lot years ago i used to do a lot of mechanical testing which helped make me become a discretionary trader but one thing that came out of that and a lot of good came out of it so i don't want to discourage you from mechanical testing just don't you don't have to tell me about your mechanical testing just go out and test if you want and, and enjoy yourself and have fun doing it i don't have enough time to 
help you work on your systems and all. So just go out there and do it on your own. So it's not a bad exercise. It's certainly not an exercise of futility. I, I did learn a lot from it. And one thing I learned is this longer-term trend following has, believe it or not, about a 28% success percent correct, okay, or uh, success rate, I should say. So you're going to be long. You're going to be wrong over 70% of the time, round numbers, and I think that's pretty good. So let's just round it off. So three out of four times you're going to be wrong in capturing these longer-term trends. But if you can go in and predict a short-term trend, and I don't have somebody's going to say, oh, well, Dave, what's a percent correct? I don't know. I don't know, and I don't care. It's, it's big enough to work, okay? I know there's an edge there. But it's certainly much bigger. Let's just say it's 50-50, okay? That's probably safe to say. Uh, the numbers are probably 61.5%, but who's counting? But even at 50-50, that's pretty good odds, believe it or not, with proper money management. So let's say you got a 50-50 chance. Well, that's twice as good as capturing that longer-term trend. So your odds are much better shorter-term at capturing a, a trend, a short-term trend, I should say, than they are at capturing a longer-term trend. But the real money is in those longer-term trends. Now, if you read, if you do read that turtle book that I mentioned, it's by Curtis Faith, one of the things you got to realize is their drawdowns were abysmal. And at one point time, they were talking about a 70% drawdown, which I think is just ridiculous. Obviously, you can't go past, you really can't go past 50% and ever um, assume to get out alive, okay, especially if you're actually running money. And even your own money, you don't want to lose half your money. That's just that's just too much. I can't stomach that, and I don't, neither can you. Uh, but and that's what gave, um, I think, faith the wear and what am I looking for? He had the um, intestinal fortitude, if that's a word, to uh, to ride out these incredible drawdowns, and he also caught some incredible trends in the process of uh, the book. Um, so you can't predict the long term, but you can predict the short term, and you can stay with it. And so that stop is going to go from that short term swing trade type of stop to this longer term trend following type of stock and this is where the real money is now let's take a look at another example here where you go from trader to trend follower this was a little IPO triggers back here we're going to stop here and you can see it's kind of beautiful it's almost textbook in nature just kind of ran straight up so I'll stop ran straight up along with it and then we were able to ride out this correction it doesn't always work this well but it's pretty cool when it does. And then it took off again. So now we're kind of in wait and see mode. And until it starts making new highs, it made a marginal new closing high yesterday. But we didn't do anything. We just say, you know what, let's just see if it opens up a little bit. Now it's eh, it's a tiny bit higher. It's probably about right here now. So we'll see by the end of the day, but we'll probably let that stop open up. And the beauty is now we've got a base that's being built here. Some people ask me, Dave, why not just – wait for the bases to be built and then take your stop from this base to this base and then the, the next base higher. Uh, that's There's nothing wrong with that and when we get into a year from now if we are still in this position then that's what our stops are going to look like. They're going to look like we're moving from base to base. So you can see we do have a little base that's built here but as this thing begins to break out we'll probably start following it up but at a much less accelerated pace. So it'll probably be like like um, let's say this goes like this well this stop is going to go like that it's going to be a little bit slower and we're going to allow that stop to widen out to hopefully ride out long-term corrections and by the way we're not going to worry about there's no dead money report this week but we're not going to worry about dead money because if it has longer term potential and if we're in longer term trend following mode the market doesn't always move on our time frame so here we have Let's say it made the new high here. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Uh, we almost have a month's worth of trading where it pretty much just went sideways. Well, so what? If this thing begins to break out, it starts making more money in here, then so what? You wait a month with it going sideways. That money was dead for a little while so to speak.
So what? Okay. We're in longer term trend following mode. And we're going to exit this position when they pry it from our cold, dark hands. Or, of course, when we get stopped out. Okay. So I've been talking a lot about the pressure being off. And it's easy for me to be philosophical because we've got a lot of winners in the portfolio and I have a lot of um, stocks that I've been in for forever that are doing really well. So stop me, you know, check back with me when we hit a little choppy market and we hit a drawdown and see if I'm still as calm, cool, and collected. Okay, I'm still human and, and I still get pissed off, okay, when things will go my way. But but lately I have been a little philosophical in that, geez, is it really this easy? Okay. Um and my answer is no, it's not really that easy, but it's not nearly as complicated as everyone makes it. Just let these positions work. And don't watch every little tick and think, oh, it's up, oh, it's down, oh, it's up, oh, it's down. You know, really all you need to do is say, where is the stock? And in this particular case, this one that's right here, okay? Where is my stop? It's right here, okay? What should I do? And the answer is nothing. Okay? Let it go. And then hopefully a year from now or two years from now or three years from now, we'll be looking at that same position. It's been a while since we held on to one for a couple of years. But I think it'll happen again. And I think it'll be kind of fun to, uh, to ride them out. This one up here, which has taken a little discretion, has been open for a long, long time. Uh, looking at the portfolio this week. Anything that's has white above it is now become a longer term trend following position. So it's yellow when the position is still open, it's white when the position is taken off. When both are taken off, like the A and V, it comes out of a spreadsheet. I like having I like looking at both of them because it reminds me of my trading loaf and my trending loaf and Sometimes if things aren't working out on the uh, trading loaf, like right here, this one hasn't really worked out just yet. As you can see, it's the, the open profits are much less than, than the original trading profits. It just helps me to see that, hey, overall, it's still a profitable position, and I'm going to stick with it. So I like leaving the uh, half loaf in the spreadsheet, and as we talked about quite a bit, I like dividing the position into both the trading position and the trending position. So let's look at this one down here, the URZ, which hasn't quite gotten to that profit target just yet. This is going to be my trading one. I'm going to flip it out as soon as it hits my profit target. And I'm going to hold on to this one hopefully for 10 years and watch it go up 100 bucks. And that's going to be my trending low. Okay. Now these numbers aren't huge on the trending side just yet. But you can see it's beginning to work a little bit, okay? Because we've got the initial profit here of a little bit less than a thousand, which is based on a 100k account, based on two percent, based on two thousand dollars risk. We reset it to 100k every time we take a new trade, just to keep the math easy. Uh, what I have done is I went back in and looked at things on a compounding rate which is probably a little bit more uh, realistic in the real world. And uh, the numbers in general look a lot better than they do by tracking them uh, on this uh, 100K rate. But I digress. So anyway, you can see we have hopefully a long-term trend developing in this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one, and this one, okay? So I think... Is it seven out of eight, or now we're now in longer term trend following mode? Obviously, they're all not going to work out, but you can see the numbers are going to look pretty good when they do. So now we're at 2.7% overall, a 50% gain, as you can see, and a 50 something percent gain in this one, a little bit over 2% compared to the 1%. Okay, we're twice as much, we're going to get two twice as much as we took on the first loaf. And hopefully, this one's almost three times. Hopefully this number becomes much, much bigger and many times this number, okay? So that's the transition from longer, from shorter term trader to longer term trader. 
Um, I like playing little games, and this somehow some people this clicks with, some people it doesn't. But when the playing games part, but sometimes it's uh, like I say quite often. I'll play keep the change. Okay, let's say my stop is five points away. Let's say the stop's at forty one, and then today it closes at forty one eleven. Okay, well I'll just leave my stop five points away and now my stop has widened by 11 cents okay and say the next day it goes up a few pennies or maybe even 20 cents or so and now it's at 31 well I'm not gonna go through the hassle of bumping my stop up a little bit and a stock especially when it's a higher price stock like this so I'll leave it here and now my stop is going from 531 so often by doing nothing especially if the market is just creeping higher or the stock, I should say, is creeping higher, then you can just let it wide now, and you get that wider stop in place, okay? And you can't, you got to be careful looking and monetizing the trade. And we're all guilty of doing it, um, especially when you put it in a spreadsheet, and especially if you have, um, if you're updating these spreadsheets in real time or updating them frequently, you tend to look or just look at your brokerage account. I mean, every time I log in, it tells me my net change. It's the first thing I see, okay? And you got to be careful with that because that can kind of suck you in, scare you out or whatever, and make you outthink the positions that you're in. And, again, you have to be willing to give up some of that open profit. And, and don't monetize it. Don't say, well, I can rush out. I can run out and buy a car with that open profit or whatever, or I can make some mortgage payments or whatever, as long as you have a separate trading account where you're trading for that longer term capital growth, then and your other expenses are taken care of, then by all, it, 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 I would encourage you to do that because uh, seeing like you don't need the money is uh, what one of my clients used to say when we talked about setting up portfolios and such, and that's how he's got things set up now and his life became a lot better and a lot easier so he's not he's not betting his lifestyle as much as he used to so it's very important to do that and not monetize every little zig or zag looking at a three thousand dollar open profit well three thousand dollars it's not a whole lot of money but it's nothing to sneeze at that's that's not a bad amount of money and you can monetize that into what you could buy for that and that's where you get in a lot of trouble because you tend to be, um, you tend to want to take that profit, okay? And it's like uh, from an ego standpoint, you're worried that you no longer will be right. Well, so what? There's going to be plenty enough trades coming down the pike, and you will be right enough longer term as long as you're following sound money management, as long as your stock picking is good and as long as you're following your plan. Now, obviously, it doesn't always work. So does it always work? Of course not. But it pays to play, as you can just see, as you just saw the spreadsheet. So I looked at the last two closed trades, and sometimes you get a great-looking setup. I mean, this was a first thrust down. You had a little bit of a pullback in here, which completes the first thrust. Also had a bit of a bow tie all-time highs it kind of just lost steam in here and went sideways you got a big amount of overhead resistance this is about as textbook as textbook as they come uh, I guess the moving averages could be a little bit more perfect you would have got that cross and recross here but for the most part you're not gonna get a much better looking setup than this and then it triggered and then it initially started moving in our favor, but then what happened? It turned around and went straight back up, and you get stopped out. Now, I don't remember exactly. We might have trailed it stopped down a little bit. So you did get stopped out for a full loss, but, hey, it's a loss nonetheless. So sometimes you get stopped out, and sometimes you get lucky, and you get the better of the poke of the eye trade. Okay, now this was – I'm not going to use the word frustrating, but unfortunately this would actually – took off again. The reason I want to show you this one again, this was from a couple of weeks ago, but what's cool here is for as example purposes, not in reality, okay, is we, we bumped that stop up and actually stopped kind of look like this 
And then when that profit target is hit, we accelerated higher to get to break even, okay? And then it came down, stops out, and then, of course, it off to the races. So sometimes your short term, it doesn't work out over the short term to where you could get into that longer term trend. But that's okay. We're going to look to get in this stock again someday. And I, I was on a radio show a couple of weeks ago, and as I said, as they were closing, I thought they were done, and I'm getting ready to hang up my phone, and, and he, he squeezed it in right before the break. Hey, Dave, give me a stock that's going to go up 50 points. And I'm like, uh, A and V, <laughs> because it made a major bottom, and I think it was at 50 bucks at some point in time. So I threw that one out. So I still think it has longer-term potential. It just didn't work out over the short term, other than a better than a poke in the eye trade, which we annualized out to about 140%. It won't be that much once you put the money management in, but on a net-net basis, at least percentage-wise, over a short period of time, if you captured that type of move, it annualizes out pretty nice. So it depends on how you want to look at it. But regardless of how you look at it, if you could make those trades, if you could make enough of those trades, you'd, you'd be pretty you do pretty good. You do especially well if you can capture that occasional longer term trend. Okay. Any questions on the trend following? Shorter term to longer term, the fact that you can only predict the short term, the fact that the money's in the long term, the fact that the drawdowns are abysmal with longer term. But if you're trading short term and taking those partial profits, your position size is going to be a little bit smaller. That's going to help mitigate those losses. And then if you do have the, uh, or if you're blessed, I should say, with a big profit, then it's okay to give up some of that profit in a tip to give to get even more profit. And the question is, how much is enough? It's never enough. So I want to make 1,000%, 2,000%, maybe 10,000% on a position. Some people say, well, system testing shows that your, your maximum, uh, adverse, whatever, your biggest moves, uh, what's you, you get maybe 300%, that's about all you ever get. Well, if you just get one 10,000% trade, then you made your decade, okay? So I'm willing to hang out for those extreme outliers where it goes past that uh, point where you do get into that longer term trend, where you get into that developing technology and that technology of the future becomes uh, not just the technology of the future, but the technology of today. All right. Enough on that. No questions. Fine. That's good. That's good. All right. What's your plan? And this has come up a lot lately. I did a, um, a presentation for a college yesterday and we ended up talking a lot about planning your trade and trading your plan, to my surprise. Um, I get emails all the time, a lot, of, a lot of them are from people who should know better, who are, Dave, what should I do with this? I'm like, what's your plan? They don't have a plan, okay? And as I wrote in layman's, if you think about going on a vacation, Let's, and I said people plan their lives, but not their trades. So unless you're Kwai Chain Kane, and I hope I said that right. He's an American anyway. <laughs> That's not his real name. And you're just going to wander around the West. You're probably going to do some planning. Now, I'm not going to read all of this to you, but for the most part, you're going to make sure you have a place to stay. You're going to know how you're going to get there. And you're not just going to wander around. So the, and you can look at many other aspects of your life, and you plan them. And you, you can't just go about life in a haphazard type of way. It requires a lot of planning. But for some reason in trading, people do not plan their trade. So they don't know where they're going to get in. They don't know where they're going to get out. They don't know how, what they're going to risk. And it's amazing that people trade without a plan, even though you can lose a lot more money than, let's say, a vacation that you don't um, follow through with the plan or whatever. So it's very important that you plan your trade and trade your plan. And I know it's cliche, but it's shocking how many people don't do this. Now, I went for a little walk, went to walk the dog right before this show, get a little fresh air, clear my mind a little bit. And one thing I started thinking about in this slide I put in the last two minutes when I got back 
is why don't we plan? And it's a good question. I think that if you plan, it forces you to face reality. Now, if you're talking about the aforementioned vacation, then the deal is, it's like, well, you know, you're not going to drive to a city and then ride around all night after driving all day looking for a hotel. You're going to make sure ahead of time, either there's plenty of vacancy so you don't, or you could actually book a hotel. It, it, you're not going to fly somewhere and risk spending the night in the airport because there's no other place to sleep. You don't want to live through that reality, especially if you have a family with you and especially you have children with you. You're going to plan. But when it comes to trading, you don't want to face that reality. And I guess part of the problem is that, re that reality is an uncertain reality. If you don't check your car out and gas it up and get the oil changed and, and do all these other things and check your tires, you're going to run out of gas along the way or you're going to have some possible mechanical issues with your car or whatever. If you don't book your flights ahead of time, you might not get a flight. So you know that reality. That reality is a real reality. But in the markets, you never really know what the reality is going to be. And then by not planning, you're not forced to face that reality. Okay. So it's an unrealized reality. The problem is the market is a bad teacher. So if you go in without a plan, and let's just say one part of that plan is without a stop. If you go without a stop, well, the market comes back strongly after an adverse move that you should have exited, and it rewards that bad behavior, rewards that lack of planning. Okay? It's also much more exciting to fly by the seat of your pants. Okay? Once you put that stop in, it becomes a reality. If that stop gets hit, it gets hit, it takes you out, it becomes a reality. But if you're not using a stop and you have no plan, then you get to watch it go up and watch it go down, and you get excited when it goes up, and you get bummed out when it goes down. But in the long run, the lack of planning is really going to affect you. And as I told, I've got a client. Um, I like to pick on him a little bit. I write about him in the book and stuff. And and he was kind of haphazard and lack of planning. And then I told him, I said, once you start planning your trades out and doing things properly, a trading at a proper size, okay? And I don't want to digress too far, but if you take a big, huge bet on a position and it pays off, that's pretty exciting. Well, it's also pretty exciting if it goes against you, okay? It's a different kind of excitement. It's a frustration. But it gives you that, uh, I guess, gambler's feel or some sort of uh, excitement. And I told him, I said, once you start planning your trades and doing things properly, you're going to reach a point where it's almost boring. And I think he's come to that realization. And every now and then, like yesterday, I'll get an email saying that, uh, hey, I'm in this and I'm in that, and what's what do I do? And it's like, ah, let's take a step back What's your plan, okay? Um, and again, there's a lack of an accountability, okay? If you have a plan, you have faced that reality. You face a reality where it's possible that your plan may not work out, and here's your contingency uh, being a protective stop in that position, okay? It's possible that you might get knocked out of that longer-term trend, so here's your plan. You've got that trailing stop. But if you're flying by the seat of your pants and you don't have any accountability, it's like you feel like you're getting away with something. But trust me, longer term in the market, you're not going to get away with anything. So you need to focus on trading, planning that trade, trading that plan. I was thinking, it's like, you know, if I talk too much about this, am I going to put myself out of business on the educational side? And as I'm doing my little walk, I got to thinking, I was like, you know what? No, I'm not. Because now, instead of using B when you're in freakout mode, you could be proactive and become more successful and then use B to help 
stock selection it help the it, these more advanced concepts to really do well longer term so by preaching constant preaching about planning your trade and when everybody plans their trade I think it's going to actually be good for me and not put me out of business okay all right enough on that strumming my pain what your fingers <laughs> Is that uh, what is that from? Killing me softly or something? Hey Dave, got delivery of your first book today. Used now have the trio, the plan. All right, Howard, fantastic. I actually um, I actually I actually buy used uh, copies of my own books on the open market because they're actually worth. There's some cases they're worth a lot of money. Um, you have two identical looking setups. Does the actual price per share help you decide? Uh, if you had two identical looking setups, okay, I get this question a lot. You know, I'm, I'm probably a bad salesman. I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to do a little pimping later on towards the end of the webinar about my stock selection webinar and how great it was. Um, and it was, but I, I got a lot of questions a couple of days ago. Someone called me up and they were asking me a bunch, a bunch of questions. And every question they asked me, which kind of made me feel good from an ego standpoint, was answered in that stock selection webinar. And it just made me feel pretty good. I'm just not a good salesman. I didn't say, oh, could you go take a look at this, this webinar? <laughs> and the and that's one of the questions that was asked. What do you do with two identical looking setup so when you can't decide is it is it the higher price one is the lower price one well they're probably not that identical one probably has a little bit better persistency one might have a little bit more acceleration in the trend so you want to look for persistency acceleration one might have the ability to trade more cleanly than the other one okay and there's a one might have less overhead resistance. Now, if you go through this mental list of all of these things that we discussed, and, a, and, a, and quite a few of them, not to just pimp the webinar, but if you go to my website, there's a, there's a free intro to stock selection webinar where I did cover quite a few of those topics as a bit of a teaser, but a lot of them are in there. Okay, uh, Persistency, ability to trade cleanly, no overhead resistance, etc. So if you boil it down to, to two setups and you can decide, and let's say they're both in the same sector, so you can rule out the sector, but if they're in two different sectors, maybe pick the one that's the better sector. But if you boiled it down and you did everything, 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 you could do two things. One, you could take both setups, especially if they're in different sectors. Two, if they're in the same sector, you could take positions, or I should say you could put orders in both, and after one, whatever one triggers first, go with that one. And there's three, from a theoretical standpoint, if you're just looking to figure out how to pick one stock over the other, and you can't figure, out, figure it out after going through all this analysis, then quite simply, you pick the one that has, wait for it, a the higher volatility reading. Okay, so if one, if they're both clean, trade cleanly. If they both have acceleration of trade, if they both pull back, and you go through all of these things after watching the stock selection webinar or the intro to stock selection webinar, and after reading all the books, um, my three books and all, and you can't decide, then pick the one that has the slightly higher volatility or the higher volatility I should say and that's the one you want to go with because it's demonstrated that it can move more in the past and will likely continue to move more in the future okay written plan is not the same as mental plan seat of pants plan yeah it, it it's it, it's that force reality it really is it's a force reality if you if you make that plan ahead of time and I guess some people's head if they have a stop in place then they're like saying oh I'm admitting that I could be wrong well guess what you could be wrong I mean that setup I showed you two slides back three slides back I feel like I was counting my chickens long before <laughs> On that one, I was like, "Oh man, this thing's gonna uh, this thing's gonna implode. That's gonna be the best short of the year. I'm gonna come. 
I'm going to show you guys this setup next week in the week of charts, and the week after, and the week after, and we're going to ride down to zero. Well, what's the old saying? God laughs at your plans, you know? Um, all predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff could happen between now and then, and life is what hap what's happens to you while you're making other plans. But if you do plan that trade in that particular case, and that stock's still going up today, I think, and I really thought I was going to die, it forces you to face the reality. It forces you to say, hey, I was wrong. But guess what? Let's look at what happened after. That was our last losing trade. Okay? <laughs> Not last forever. There's going to be more. Okay? But after that trade, look at what happened. We had the A and V for 1,000 and then zero and then all of this. Okay? So if I was sitting around watching that trade evaporate my account day after day after day, I might not have been in the proper mental mindset to recognize all these winners that were just around the corner. Okay, I, I talked to a client once, and we were looking at some setups, and they looked pretty good. And he says, "Oh, but I'm I'm busy nursing some some losing trades." It's like, what the hell does that mean? It's like, either you have a stop or you don't. Okay. And he missed the next opportunity, or, op or more importantly, opportunities, because he was busy, and I quote, nursing some losing positions, okay? How do you handle overhead supply with a Phoenix stock? Well, you're going to have some, and that's just a fact of life, okay? Let's see if we get a white screen here, okay? The question is, I call them Phoenix stocks. And Phoenix stocks are, they rise from the ashes. Uh, Dick Fruth calls them tombstones. He's in the, um, he's a fellow member of the AAPTA. And he has a different, a uh, little bit different approach to it, but we kind of both agree on the same thing. But a Phoenix stock is a stock that just comes down here and bottoms out. Gold stocks have done this uh, in more recent times. Go back a little further, last December, that's what the solar stocks look like. And they begin to take off from the lows and maybe form a cup and handle, saucer and handle, bow tie, first thrust, or some other transitional type of pattern. So the question is, how do you handle overhead resistance? Well, if you go in and watch the stock selection webinar, see, I'm going to get better at selling here. <laughs> uh, there's a couple things. One, you need to ask yourself, how far back in time is it? And the further back in time, the better. But markets do have fairly long memories. So even if it's two or three years back, it could be substantial. How wide is it? Because the wider it is, the more people who have traded in that area. And then the next question is, how far away is it? Okay. Now, what he's saying is with the Phoenix stock, it might not be a straight shot down. You probably will have some overhead resistance along the way. But the first question you ask yourself is, hey, how far away is that overhead resistance? If it's 100% away, who gives a flip, okay? If I get in a position in that XL we carried, uh, was a was a stock insurance company, I guess, XL, we were with that for about two and a half years, almost three years. And that thing had, when we got in it, I forget where we got in, maybe about 11. And they get 22 or 32 and it overhead supply. I was like, well, who cares? Okay, if it goes up 100%, I'm a happy camper. And the other thing you can tell yourself itself, if it goes up 100%, maybe it could get past that overhead supply. Because if it, over your demonstrator, you go up 100%, maybe it could go up another 100%. So if it's 100% away, no problem. If it's 50% away, Eh, I need to think about it, but that might not be too bad. I might take that trade. And then the other thing you might have to ask yourself is, is it a commodity-related stock which can chop around a little bit, and or are you willing to be a little bit more lenient, like uranium right now, big bull in uranium, okay? Take a look at URA. We'll take a look at it in a minute. Let's take it off. We're long URZ. Uh, if you're not long URZ, I can't give you a direct recommendation because – 
all things are for what? Educational purposes only. But I think URZ looks pretty good. Okay. So it depends on how wide the overhead supply is, how far above the market it is, how far back in time it is. So the answer to that is it depends. But we have brains in our head, okay? Brains in our heads, feet in our shoes, shoes in our feet, feet in our shoes. You can steer yourself in any direction you choose. What did, what did Dr. Seuss say in other places you will go? Good book, best book ever in trading psychology, by the way. <laughs> Dr. Seuss's Oh, the Places You Will Go. I have to put a link on my website. Okay. Uh, definitely worth reading, though. You can read it in uh, five minutes. Okay. Written plan is not the same as middle plan. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Eric has a portfolio management question. Um, but, yeah, getting back to the overhead supply, just just use your brain. Use some common sense. And, and you know, here's the secret. Trading all balls down to making decisions and living with decisions. So when you make that decision, if you tell yourself, self, I know this stock is overhead resistance, but I like the setup so much, I think it's worth taking even though it has an overhead resistance. And then plan your trade and then trade your plan. So if you feel like it's worth taking, then take it and make that decision and just know that you had that overhead, uh, overhead supply to deal with. And that's how you become really good at using your brain, at training your brain, at making these discretionary calls, and you become a better and better discretionary trader. You make decisions and you live with them, okay? And so that's the bottom line. That's how you get good at it. It will take a little experience. I could talk to them blue in my face, but it will take a little experience to figure it all out. All right, Eric has a portfolio manager question. In some cases, many stocks with a certain sector will trend. Specifically, easy for me to say, biotech as of late. Do you limit your portfolio to so many stocks within a sector which you will hold? Yes. Example, I currently have three biotech stocks which are profitable, but taking a fourth might expose too much within one sector. Usually, my rule of thumb is two within one sector. Sometimes I get so excited about setups. Uh, I've been that rule a little bit, but uh, here's what you have to remember. Uh, let's say you buy Biotech ABC. Well, remember, that's going to be a, a trending loaf, or I, I should say a trading loaf and a trending loaf. Trending. Okay, so trade and trend. How can we uh, abbreviate? Let's call it uh, TR and TD. Okay. Oops. Let's see if we have a white screen. Okay. So we buy ABC. And we have a trading loaf and a trending loaf. Let's just call it TD for trend. Okay. And then let's say we buy XYZ. So my unwritten rule is that I will buy up to two positions at one sector. But let's say that you hit the profit target on this one, okay, and then you hit the profit target on this one. So you have two positions, but logically, if we're dividing this into loaves, one loaf, one loaf, one loaf, now you take off one, you take off one, so now you have two on, and you're allowing yourself a maximum of four when you're looking at lows, okay? So two positions, two positions, two lows, okay? One half, one half, one half, whatever. How do you want to look at it, okay? So if you get profits hit on this one and this one, that opens up one whole slot, one whole new position. So now you might want to put in uh, DEF and DEF, okay? That's another, let's say that's another biotech. So now you've got one half a position here, one half a position here, and you got one full position here. So that's equivalent of two positions, okay? Let's um, look at this another way, too. When you're taking profits, when you're taking profits off, in fact, we can look at the open portfolio. It might be even easier there, okay? So let's say that you've got, like, this RLP. This is a biotech. We see another biotech coming along. 
Well, you've already taken half your profits off, okay? So you only have a half a position left, and you allow yourself up to two, okay? So you could take on another uh, position because you're already taking profits on half. So if you take two positions and you take half off, then you could take another position, okay? And if things are really going well, you could push it a little bit. But Eric's point that I think he's getting to is that that rising tide or, falls in, fall, or worse, a falling tide, if you're long, is going to sink all boats. So uh, we just had a pretty serious correction in biotech. And if you were long 10 biotech stocks, those 10 stocks, instead of trading as 10 great-looking, fantastic-looking setups, are going to all of a sudden, they're all going to trade as one big old position, and then you're going to be in a lot of trouble really fast, okay? So three is not crazy, Eric, but if you've already gotten into three positions, and that's where the ebb and flow comes in, okay, and Eric's saying enough. <laughs> no, I'm not stopping. It's, uh, it's, you, can't, you can't stop me. Uh, but if you've got three on, ABC, ABC, CDE, CD, uh, FGH, and FGH. If you've got three on and you haven't started hitting initial profit targets, this is where you might need to begin to worry a little bit, okay? Why am I not hitting profit targets yet, okay? But it should be like you're putting this one on, you're putting this one on, you're taking this one off, you're taking this one off, you're putting this one on. It should be an ebb and flow to where you might get a little bit overweighted, but you shouldn't get too overweighted in a sector. And it's just like if we go back to the portfolio um, a while back, you know, when I get about right here in the portfolio and I haven't hit a profit target, let's say it's one, two, three, four, I get about five positions on, five or six positions on, and I haven't hit a profit target yet, I begin to ask myself, self, were these setups really that great? Is the market really that great? Is the market doing that well? Am I in trouble? You know, you really need to think about it. Once you get four or five or six positions on and, and none of them are hitting the profit targets, and especially if you're not really uh, profitable over here, if these numbers are pretty small over here, then before you put on that sixth or seventh or eighth position down here, you need to say, wait a minute. Do I really, really, really like this setup? Is the market trending? Does the market look pretty good? Does the sector look good? Are there any of the stocks within the sector that are confirming my decision? This is where you get really, 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 really selective, okay? Now, let's say you're in a portfolio like right now, and you got, you know, you're taking one, you get another, get another, get another, get another, get another. Then, I'm not saying get careless, but I'm just saying that you, you're in a position of strength where you could take that setup and say, well, it's not ideal, but I do like it, okay? It's a little uranium company, and it's kind of wild and crazy, and I know I'm kind of going off on a flyer here, but I'm going to take it because I think it has potential, and I think it's worthwhile, okay? So let your own portfolio tell you how good you're doing, and then make that next decision based on how well you've done in the recent past, because that's going to be a reflection of the overall market. And if you're trading, by the way, if you're trading high beta stocks as we do, higher volatility stocks, uh, you're going to get whacked a little bit right before that market takes a turn, and there's a good chance because, like, I've, I've got a, a list of 100 stocks. I call it Landry 100, and those are all high beta stocks. And one thing that I've learned from tracking this list is that list gets whacked really hard, and the market will be flat. I'll, I'll lose, like, 3% on that entire list, and the market will be down maybe a quarter percent, half percent or whatever. It's like I feel like, you know, I'm from Fargo. It's like, oh, geez, oh, geez, like, here it comes. I know that I'm going to get whacked pretty hard over the next couple of days in the market because that high beta list is going to get tanked long before the market will actually crash. So that's just for what it's worth. I want to throw that out to you. But if your portfolio does start to tank a little bit or if it's just not flat out performing, then you need to just be a little extra careful and, and think a little hard about uh, the next position. Okay, I'm not going to beat the dead horse too much when the pressure's off, but I just like this cool little graphic. And stop worrying about the bull versus bear. It's like every freaking day that the market goes down a little bit, 
I get emails. Dave is just the top. I'm freaking out. I just got in yesterday. Blah, blah, blah. What do I do? It's like, no, the pressure's off. Don't stress yourself out. Okay. And that all comes back to planning your trade, training your plan. I know I'm being a dead horse on that. Uh, a couple of random thoughts real quick. The, the map the map is not the territory. It's, uh, I, I've gotten emails about these longer-term systems, and they're, they're saying, well, you'd make this percentage if you do this and all this. And I'm like, yeah, but you got some really bad drawdowns in there. And they're like, oh, but you know, it's okay. It, it, it doesn't seem to bother them. And then the market sells off, and then I get an email. It's like, oh, what do I do? It's like, well, what do you do? Well, I thought we were talking about systems that have these abysmal drawdowns in the past. So you've got to get your head wrapped around what you're doing. And if you look at the little blip that the market made, which we could do in just one second, you can't even see it on a 10-year chart, you know. And that's what your system was based on. So make sure you wrap your head around that and just know that the map is not the territory. Once you're in there and once you're in the trenches, it looks a lot differently than when you're kind of like hovering above it all. So remember that. Um, take things one day at a time. Market's kind of tanking a little bit today. I'm watching it unfold as I'm speaking. And I'm kind of, you know, it's kind of aggravating, but let's just see how it shakes out. Let's see what it does tomorrow. Let's see what it does this afternoon. Okay, let's just take it one day at a time. Who was it said that, uh, you know, I'm, I hate to quote someone without knowing who it is, but someone said that the great thing about the future is it comes at you one day at a time, which is a brilliant quote. I'll have to Google that and give them my credit. If somebody wants to Google it now. I'll be happy to give them credit now because I don't. I hate to not give credit. Um, recently, we had a few days where there wasn't much to do in the overall market, and that's an exercise in patience, which is very important. And one thing I thought about is is that let the market come to you. And I did a couple of columns recently on that. And this morning I was reading um, uh, Market Profits by Eddie Z. I'm actually in there, so uh, shameless plug. And it's a pretty cheap book. It's, I think it was like 99 cents on Kindle a while back. Um, and how much is a hardcover? I don't know. Maybe 10 bucks, 20 bucks. Anyway, it's a pretty good book. Yeah, I've been enjoying reading it. And um, it's like I read three quarters of it. I'm just getting around to reading the, the last uh, interview. Uh, but there's a few little gems in it. And like any trading book on trading that I get, if I get one gem out of it, then it's certainly worth its while. I would never rip somebody a new, a new one in a trading book if I got one little tiny idea out of the book. Okay, uh, so but there's a few good gems in there, and I like what I read this morning. The market is not going out of business, and this was a gentleman that was being trade, uh, was being um, trained by a mentor. Okay, oh, Abe Lee could quote. Okay, thank you. I'll give him credit here in one second. And he was being traded, he was being trained by a mentor, and he was, I guess he was teaching him patience in that he didn't have to be in there, in and out, in and out, like a crazy man, pick your spots carefully. And he said, the market is not going out of business, which I thought was brilliant. So uh, one of the little gems that I picked up from that. So check out that book if you get a chance. It's on my website somewhere. And again, it's cheap, really cheap um, price-wise. Uh, and continue to play a good offense in 2014. I mean, this is what I'm holding myself to. I'm trying to find the best of the best setups. Not that I, not that I didn't always do that, but I'm certainly making a cognitive um, attempt this year to pick the best of the best setups. And what do they call it? Deliberate practice is is what I am working on. And if you read some of like. Malcolm Gladwell and people like that. He's one of my favorite, if not my favorite, off author. Uh, read all of his books. All of his, you always get something good out of him. He doesn't tell you exactly what to do, but he makes you think, which is kind of cool. But he did talk about deliberate practice in one of his books. I think it was Outliers. And deliberate practice is very important. It's if you look at the people and um, success is, uh, or I should say, talent and success, however you want to look at it. But in most cases, or say 99% of the cases, talent is made and not born. So that's a good thing. That's great. So that takes the pressure off of me and you and 99% and of other the rest of us that weren't born with this innate talent to be able to go in and trade markets 
and, and see trends developing and such. But the good thing is we can learn how to do it. And again, I'm going to work to get better in 2014 and 15, 16, 17, et cetera, at becoming a better and better stock picker and picking the best and make sure I've got that good offense going in. Okay, and then I'll worry about defense. But worry about your offense first and pick the best. And it's that deliberate practice. When I'm looking at charts every day, it's not just I got to watch that I'm not just flipping through them and not thinking too much. I got to make sure that I'm, it's actually a practice for me. And I think that's a great thing to do is whenever you're trying to get better at whatever you're doing, just make sure you're doing that deliberate practice. And there's a lot there's a lot that's been written on deliberate practice. So um, check that out. If you get a chance. All right, I'm kind of ready to jump into the charts. I'm sure you guys are. Oh, a couple announcements. I almost forgot. Um, stock selection webinar is uh, we have finished up the uh, weekly follow up sessions. There were eight follow up sessions, I think. Yeah, eight. And it's six, uh, the six hours. So it was 14 hours total. Um, these are the actual stocks that were picked in the original uh, webinar, by the way. And this is on my website under stock selection webinar. So check that out. Um, six months free to the trading service for anyone who signs up on that. Um, my first two books are still available, and they're in ebook format. Or if you look on the internet, you can get them sometimes. Uh, um, as I pick them up every now and then, as I said earlier, you can find paper co uh, paper copies of those, um, and they are becoming more rare. But uh, if you need the ebooks, shoot me an email. Um, if you watch this webinar, or just say. You just get this one and say, hook me up, Dave, and I'll give you the first one. Throw it in uh, this week. How's that? Um, I have volume two of 2013 for the week of charts. If you like these uh, weekly presentations, you'll love those. It's about 30-something hours. So, again, check out my website for more on that. I do have a trading service. It's amazing. People are like, you have a trading service? Like, yeah, you've been following me for years, and you didn't know that. So I guess I'm, again, a bad marketer. But here. Right there, and there's your info right there. It's all on my website. Okay, let's hop into the charts. And if you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, that's fine. Just ask about them one line at a time. In other words, punching the symbol, hit return, and then punching the next symbol. And then I'll start looking at the overall market, and we'll hop into your um, – we'll take a look at your stocks. Um, Abe Lincoln is who said – um, <laughs> I guess he didn't mind that I misquoted him or didn't quote him there, but uh, to give full credit, based on the Google search, it looks like uh, you guys have found it's Abe Lincoln, or you you may have known that, huh? I'm impressed. All right, let's take a look at the the overall market. Let's take a look at the P's, and then let's work our way out. Um, I like to look at the micro, and then take a look at a little bit bigger picture in the market. Um, one thing I did like, let me back this out just a little bit. I want to show you something that was kind of cool developing in here. You had one, two, three, four. Now, it's not that many, but it's still enough. You had this the market flatline for about four days in here on a net-net basis and then begin to sell off a little bit, okay? Now, yesterday, it tailed lower, came back in. If you look at the spiders, it's more of an open gap reversal, but you get the idea. And we can take a look at those. You can see more of an open gap reversal. So I actually kind of like the way it did this. I like the way it kind of did a little fake out after a low volatility situation. One thing I've discovered, and it was almost it was almost written about, but some, some things fell through and it didn't actually come out. But one thing I discovered with volatility is if you get, as you know, volatility tends to revert back to the mean, sometimes even more so than price. And that's why I did a lot of studies in volatilities, which kind of uh, had Connors and I hooking up for a while on some things because we both kind of were really fascinated by volatility. And um, Larry was really into volatility, and that kind of got me sort of the genesis for me getting into it. And one thing I noticed is that uh, let's say you have a market and the volatility dries up. So the volatility looks like this, and then it begins to dry up. One thing I've noticed is you get a fake out move and then the real move will ensue afterwards. Now, it was an extreme condition in the S&Ps, but it can um but it can it can sometimes happen on an extreme basis. So it's kind of a micro deal and I didn't actually measure the volatility. I just eyeballed it and said, "Well, this market's been quiet for a while. It's due to make a move." So we had a bit of that sell-off. And that's what I was talking about in today's column. 
and thinking that this would clear the way for the market to trade higher. And obviously, we had a little bit of opening gap this morning, but that's already reversed itself. So we're back kind of in question mark mode, which is fine. So what do we do? Should we sell everything? No, just on your stops, just in case. That's all you need to do. Okay. Uh, so that's looking a little questionable. Um, hopefully, I'd like to see. Let's get back to the cash. I'm just going to spend a few minutes on the market, and we'll get to your stock. So don't. Uh, I'll give you plenty of time on that. Last week we couldn't. We didn't keep up. Last couple of weeks. Uh, take a look at the P's. 1850. Uh, not the end of the world if we drop below it, but. The only problem I have is that usually I like to see a, a peak cleared uh, decisively. So what will happen, let's just take a look at this real quick. Um, with a double top, very rarely do they set up in this textbook manner. What happens is a couple of things. One, they undershoot and then roll over, and that becomes like a gatekeeper or something like that. Or two, they overshoot and then come back in, okay? They'll overshoot that double top. This gives everybody all clear. The water's great. Come on in, then it comes back in. One of these is a, a Derek Hobbs shark bite. I forget which one, but it looks something like that. Like that would be your shark coming up to bite the market, and then it comes back in. Um, so when I encounter a potential double top situation like this, I like it to clear that prior peak decisively, and then we get into longer term, hopefully, trend following mode where it pulls back, rinse, and repeat. Okay. So that's the only thing that's got me a little bit concerned about the um, about the piece is the fact that we didn't really clear that prior peak decisively. Okay, here's your prior peak, and now we're already coming back in a little bit. But again, it's not the end of the world. And like I said earlier, if you're looking at a system over the last 20 years or whatever. Can you can you see what the market did yesterday? I don't think so, okay? Or day before, whenever it was. In fact, one thing that was kind of cool on a weekly chart I was looking at, and it, what is, it wasn't even down on a weekly chart, or not down by much. At least, well, without today's data in, it wasn't. So make sure you get the bigger picture perspective. And guess what? Um, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. There will be some drawdowns along the way, and you will have to take some losses, and that's just life. Sorry about that. Um, but so far, kind of hanging in there. Not the end of the world in the piece. Longer term uptrend still intact. Uh, as I've said at nausea, I'm not a big fan of these V-shaped recoveries at high levels, and it does kind of take on a little bit of that shark bite looking looking pattern. Not that I would ever trade that pattern, but it's something that uh, it doesn't hurt to be cognizant of certain patterns out there, even if you're not directly trading them. In fact, I would encourage you not to trade all of these patterns, okay, especially like reversal patterns, but it's okay to understand these reversal patterns and see when they may be developing. Now, that doesn't mean that you should uh, not take any new positions if you've got something that looks a little questionable. Just maybe pull in your horns a little bit. Pull in your horns a little bit and become a little bit less aggressive when that occurs. Uh, open a gap reversal, the NASDAQ, not the end of the world. Um, one thing I'm not nuts about here is that we did have a deceleration of trend. If you get a chance, as I said earlier, go in uh, here on my website where these free videos are and watch the one on stock selection. And I talked a little bit about that deceleration of trend. Where is it? It's in here, or right here. Right there, intro to stock selection. Watch that video, and I'm pretty sure, and I can check the slides and verify, but I'm pretty sure in that video I talked about um, deceleration of trend versus acceleration of trend. So if we take a look at a market, ideally, oops, that's one thing about that screen on the fly. You hit one button, it goes away. One wrong button. Okay, um, ideally you want to see a market kind of be in a gradual trend and accelerate higher. That's good uh, as opposed to this, okay? And right now that's what we got going on in the NASDAQ. Not the end of the world, one day at a time. And then the other caveat is keep in mind it is much harder to predict the overall market than it is to predict an individual stock. Not that predicting an individual stock is easy, but trust me, it's much harder to predict the overall market, okay? So it is losing some momentum based on this metric here, 
and it has pulled back a little bit, but hey, not the end of the world. And the other thing to remember, too, is let's just look at this on a net-net basis. Even with today's action, we are, uh, if I can find my screen here, there it is, we're 1.42% away from all, or multi-year highs at least, there. And in the P's, we are, let's see if it can do, what, what's today's action? Here we go. We're one percent away, one percent of change. Okay, so we're only we're less than a percent and a half. Depends on what index you're looking at, away from all-time highs in the P's and multi-year highs in the Nasdaq. So it's not that bad just yet. Okay, um, semis have pulled back a little bit. A lot of these areas that are in strong uptrends, like the semis, they notice they cleared their prior peaks in here decisively. Semis, internet, looking pretty good in here. So it's no big shocker. The NASDAQ still looks okay, okay? It doesn't look fantastic, but it still looks okay. So a lot of technology has pulled back and could be setting up soon. As I said earlier, still a big fan of uranium. You can see that it's trying to rally out of this little pullback in here uh, today. If you got faked out, maybe maybe use today's high, intraday high, as your new entry. By the way, somebody was asking me about trend pivot pullbacks and false rally pullbacks. And the... You, let's say you, you come in to trade uranium and you got distracted today, so you didn't take that first entry. Well, that's where you come in and take the second entry. You don't want to necessarily wait for a market to fake out first before taking the second entry, unless you're brand new to trading and that's the way you trade. Um, I think it was Kevin Haggerty years ago we were talking. He was doing a seminar. I was assisting him, and we were talking in break, and he says when a new guy comes to his office, he only lets them trade second entries on setups because they're going to be a little bit more accurate. But the problem with that is you're going to miss a lot of great first entries too, okay? But somebody was asking me about that. So if you miss the first entry, then the second entry uh, sometimes can work out. What's the old um, Wall Street adage? The uh, early bird gets the worm and the second mouse gets the cheese. So sometimes it's a second mouse type of trade, something like that. So hopefully that makes sense, at least makes sense to those um, – who were asking me about that. Uh, copper, steel, and iron have pretty much imploded as of late. Gold and silver kind of hanging in there. Uh, still a bull. Gold, as you do, broke, as you know, broke out uh, yesterday, or somewhat broke out yesterday. It's having a little follow-through today. I've been pretty bullish on this sector because we made this bow tie from this major, major double bottom off of many, many, many year lows in these stocks, and these stocks are just really woken up in here. So still pretty much a bull on gold. Uh, still a bull on silver, although silver, at least on a micro level, has been lagging a little bit in here. But so far it looks okay. But you can see with so many days in here, there's, there's not a whole lot of setups left over in those particular setups. Okay. Uh, what else is going on? A lot of areas made its new highs and only pulled back a little bit like chemicals. Uh, transports are just around new highs in here. They're not doing too bad, just off of all-time highs. And I think that's about all I want to cover in the sectors, uh, except for like retail is a bit of a disappointment because it made this V-shaped recovery, and it never did get past, at least uh, maybe a little bit today, but it's come, already come back in. It never did really get past its prior high in here. So I would be cautious going after an area. I would be cautious going off after an area such as retail. It's got this big V-shaped recovery at high levels. All right, let's go ahead and... Um, Let's open it up for discussion. The uh, only thing, let me just show you bonds real quick. I'll just punch them up. Oh, here they are. Bonds in here have uh, stabilized over the last couple of days or so, and they're making a nice little rally today. So bonds up, rates down, okay? So that's good. I was glad to see bonds. Bonds were kind of taken off in here, and then they began to kind of roll over, but now they're bouncing. So as long as they could stay stabilized and hopefully just chop sideways back and forth, uh, when you have a big delta in bonds, it could put um, it could affect the overall market. All right, let's uh, crank out some of these. DBA, I'm going to like Ken. Uh, Ken wants to know about DBA. Uh, DBA is a commodity related fund, and it looks fantastic. Uh, I've been following. I've got if you look at my Landry list, I've got some of these commodities like Joe in there. Let me show you my Landry 100 if I can find it. I need to clean up these watch lists in here. Here we go. Uh, I've been having a few of these commodities in here. Well, gold, obviously, just shorter term, looks pretty good, so I've been having it. 
in um, in my list just because I've been in bull and a gold stocks. You need to see, you zoom it way out, you're like, hey, Dave, what are you thinking? But if you zoom it way in, you got a pretty serious uh, uh, arrow working there. Okay, not that I'm, I'd rather have a little, um, a little silver stock or a little gold like GPL in here, things like that, as opposed to gold overall or SLV. But when the when the whole sector's moving and looking pretty good, I'll throw that into a momentum list uh, like this. I think URA is probably in here somewhere. But what's kind of cool about getting back to the commodities, take a look at like Joe, which is coffee. Okay, this is a coffee ETF, J-O. Uh, it's been on a pretty good tear as of late. So the question is DBA, which I don't know if I have in here. Yeah, I got it in here right there. Look at that. Bam, winning. Okay. I've got it in my momentum list. Why? Because it's going up. Okay? It's going up. Draw your arrows. Okay? Now, here's the deal. It's commodity related and it's an ETF. So your historical volatility is really low on this. In fact, it's not much uh, more different than the overall market. The overall market actually might be slightly volatile. So in general, I'm not going to go in and trade a stock that has a very low HV like this. But when you're looking at these commodity-related ETFs and some of these other ETFs that are trending and can trend, sometimes it might be worth a shot. It's certainly worth keeping an eye on. So, yeah, I love it, love it, love it, love it. Look at the persistency here. Okay, fantastic. Now, what you need to do is that you also have trend acceleration. Go in and watch that stock webinar. Again, it's all in there. But what you need to do, of course, is wait for a pullback before looking to get long. John says, has Moby moved up too much and too fast already? And does it need consolidate or pull back? Okay, Moby. Let's take a look at Moby. People that come together. Nine a Moby song in my head. Uh, it's got an H V of nearly a hundred. Yeah, it's kinda it's it's on the cusp of being too wild and crazy. Yeah, I mean it went up a hundred percent over a few days. So, yeah, it's a little crazy. I don't know. Let's see how it looks after a pullback, but I think um, you can get hurt in that one. Okay. Bolt. It's going to be a shipping company, right? Shipping companies in general can be pretty choppy. That's one reason I kind of hate them. Uh, but they can trend on occasion. Uh, I don't like the fact that it's kind of pulled back to its prior little peak in here, but they tend to be choppy. I'm going to give that an okay. I personally would not trade it, but I see I see where you're coming from. But, again, go in and watch that intro to stock webinar, and I bet I think we talked about that too, returning to the prior peak. And if I didn't, see, you always get you, you get it you get it one piece at a time with these. Um, you see I could return to the prior peak in here, okay? You get it one piece at a time through these webinars. Alvin wants to know about Zoo. Do you? Yeah, it looks pretty good. Um, this is a wild and crazy IPO. I think I would pass, and we talked about this one last week, because it went from 40 to 80 overnight. Okay, over two nights, or three nights. But you get the idea. It's just too extreme of a move, too far, too fast. Um, Another thing in the stock selection webinar we talked about is the bottle rockets. You get stocks that go straight up, and they tend to come straight back down. This is especially true if you take a look at some of these low price stocks that went up like four or five hundred percent over a couple days and then came right back in. Okay. Where's a good long trade entry point for A and V on the next pullback? Okay. Uh, got it shook us out. Now it's breaking out again. You know. I mean. It, it aggravates me a little bit that we got shaken out of it. But, hey, you know what? If it's going to go 50 points, it'll be time to get it along the way. So, yeah, on the next pullback, um, by all means. So uh, I won't know it. Uh, what's the Justice Potter Smith say or whatever? I'll know it when I see it, okay? So if it continues to break out, let's say it goes up to 7 or so, begins to pull back a little bit, then maybe it might be worth a shot at that juncture. I'll know it when I see it. Check back often. You're, no, John, I always forget. See, John's always looking at great stocks. I always think he's on the service, but he's not. As I say, if you're on a service, just just sit back and wait, and I'll let you know when it's set up again. Okay, question is, where's a good-looking long trade entry point for Newham again? Right now, there is none. Right now, it would have to 
it would have to break out to new highs and then pull back, maybe up to about uh, 16, 17 at least, and then pull back before I would reconsider it. But there's nothing wrong with staying long, okay? And hopefully it turns into a longer term winner. So he's asking about, he's asking about, he's looking at the portfolio. I think that's what he's doing. And he's trying to see, well, A and B got stopped out. So he's looking at the portfolio and he's looking for new entries, like on something like Newham. Okay. Oops. See, if he'd have got in at the first entry, you could, you could get another year of the service. See? Hint, hint. Look at that, John. Uh, but, no, you see, it, it, it triggered, it hit the profit target, and it's come back in quite a bit since it, it's done that. So if you look at it on the chart, obviously, it looks like that. So it's not really a setup until it goes on to make new highs and then pulls back. Okay. Uh, T and K. T and K on a pullback. Yeah, that's another shipper. Now let's count the days. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven days. That's quite a few days in a pullback. Not that I would not consider not that I would never consider a stock that had so many days, but go in and watch the stock selection webinar. So number of days and then look what happens. It pulled back past its prior peak. So that one would come off my radar as a possible setup. I've noticed quite a few IPOs have very wide spreads. Do you avoid these as you generally avoid stocks with spreads, or do you give IPOs a bit of a break? I think I give IPOs a bit of a break. Um, if you go back to that RLYP, that was my example. I had a client. Uh, it, this is why it doesn't have a full profit target on here, because there was some skittage and slippage on the open, uh, or I should say on the, on the trigger, not the open. And I had a client that was complaining when it was up around 34 or 35 because he was talking about how bad his skittage was. And I told him, here's the deal. Give me all your shares, and I will give you, I will give you your exact price on that stock, okay? I'll be happy to buy them from you at that skittage price or whatever, plus maybe a quarter. And I think that was very generous of me. And uh, he declined because the stock was at like 35, and his skittage price was like, 2755 or something. So sometimes your worst fills are your best trades. I've heard that many a times. I've read it in Market Wizards, but it's a it's an age old Wall Street adage. But I'll I'll give Market Wizards credit for that, just in case it's the first place I saw it. But yeah, I mean that's it seems like you get a crappy fill. If you get a crappy fill, it means that somebody wants the stock, or a lot of people want the stock. If you get your price. You still have a futures broker. You got your price. I'm like, eh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's no good. Um, <laughs> and then you get stopped out. But sometimes you get a crappy fill. It's like, oh, well, I got a crappy fill. But, hey, it's it's the market's now up 20% from where it was. So that's pretty good. Um, G-I-G-M, Gig'em, for Mr. John. Gig'em, G-I-G-M. Um, is that one that's on my list? Let me do something real quick here. I got an idea. Well, I can't. That's not enough time. Um, it looks okay, uh, but it, it's already triggered. It's kind of flatlined in here and taken off. So with today's action, it's already triggered. It's just too speculative. I'd probably leave that one alone. Uh, maybe if it pulls back again, it might be worth another shot. But it is kind of a penny stock. Not that I won't occasionally go after a penny stock. Go Mo. Is it G-O-M-O? G-O-M-O. Oh, I deleted it. Oh, it was GOMO. Yeah, this one's okay. Uh, now, this is an IPO. You might could give it a little bit of a pass because it did it did pull back to this prior little consolidation in here. And I was looking at this one kind of long and hard. I'll give it an okay. Um, you might not always get perfection in the IPOs, but they do, in general, tend to trade cleanly. And lately, they've been kind of on fire. If we take a look at that RLYP, uh, I gave it a couple of extra days in the pullback because I, th I still thought it had potential based on the magnitude of this move when this was an IPO. And then knock on wood, okay, so far, so good on that one. Did somebody just ask about JCP? No. No, that's, that's Nicholas Feinstock. Let's get, up. Let's get Nicholas out. Jeez. 
Nicholas Feinstein. Here we go. Nicholas Fine. Let's get him in here. Before I even look at it, I'm going to tell you, no! All right, let's take a look at it. Okay. Ah, maybe I'm wrong. Okay, first of all, it's a big, thick stock. Trades about a bazillion shares on average, okay? Um, I would leave it alone. You've got overhead, supply. It just tends to chop around a lot, okay? So, I don't know. Maybe if it cleared 10 and change, eh, no, nah, I'd leave it alone. Um, I think you could find something better out there that has more potential. Why, why for Mr. Alvin? Uh, not bad. You might need to find out what the diversified services are because that's a hard sector to qua uh, quantify. Um, if they provide diversified services to the home builders and the home builders are going down, then maybe it's not a great sector to be in. If they provide diversified services to uranium mining companies, then maybe you should buy with both fists. So find out what they do, and if you want to go, if you want to look at Yahoo and tell me, that's fine. Uh, Yahoo Finance is pretty good at finding that out. I'm going to give you an okay on this one. Uh, it did clear the prior peak. It did pull back a little bit. I would prefer it if it would have cleared the prior peak a little bit more decisively, but I'm going to give you a not bad on that one. Okay, that's why why. Chinese internet is why why. Oh, cool. Well, then, yeah, buy with both fists. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of Chinese stocks right now, okay? Um, now, this would, the only thing I would say is that it might be priced for perfection because it was down here. I would pass based on that. Uh, it was down here at 10 bucks, and now it's at 80 so it ran up about 700% or 800%, depends on how you count it. Um, it might be priced for perfection. So, yeah, be careful if you do trade that. One, I mean, it might be good for for a, a swing trade. Okay, core's going short. Well, let's see, K R S. No, why would you go short? There's nothing to short yet. Uh, you got a big gap here. Okay, yeah, it looks like it's kind of rolling over, losing steam. But wait until you get some sort of signal uh, before you uh, rush out and short it, just because it's at high levels. Okay. Dave, been buying announced secondaries of momentum type stocks when they settle. What do you think? F Y E nine months old. F Y F Y F E Y E. Been buying announced secondaries. Ah, I wouldn't. I don't think I would do that. Um, boy, I tell you, back in the day, before I flipped that pressure switch. <laughs> Back in the day, I watched every little bit of news, and when they when they they throw a secondary on the market, I would get mad. Now I don't even know when it happens. Um, but no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't trade a stock. I wouldn't buy a stock when they're throwing secondaries on the market. Just use your charts, man, <laughs> dude. <laughs> use your charts, dude. There's your words. Of, there's your words of wisdom for this week. Okay. So yeah, I hear you, Howard. Um, now he's buying when they introduce secondaries, which might be creating the pullbacks along the way. So I can't fault you for that. Uh, but look at it shorter term. You got a gap down here, and then now you haven't made any forward progress in about a month or two, or at least. So I would I would leave this one alone. Maybe stick a fork in that one. Okay, the gap is in the secondary ninety two price. Yeah, well it does. So it doesn't matter. I mean, why does that? The gap a gap is a gap is a gap. A gap is a gap. A gap. A gap. A gap is a gap is a gap. So it doesn't matter what caused the gap. A gap is a gap is a gap is a gap. Okay, that Mountain Dew has really kicked in. <laughs> Yeah, so what? 82 is the price on secondary. So what? What does that what does that have to do with anything? Still a gap. Okay? Um there could be so much demand for the stock that uh it could open at 90 on the secondary. Um, you know, who knows? That doesn't mean it's going to actually trade there. They price it there, but what does that mean? Okay? Don't think too much. A uh, gap is a gap, a gap, a gap. 
Uh, too much overhead resistance. Who asked about this one? Andre. You know better than that. Nicholas Fine. No. Andre also wants to know about Rose G. Rose G. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Let's take a look at this. Yeah. Um, maybe on a pullback. I, it's just got, I, I prefer if it didn't have just one or two big bars in here, if that trend was a little bit more gradual and accelerating. But uh, on a pullback, possibly. JC, JGW? JG, never heard of it. JGW. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of it. Um, JG Whitworth or something? Maybe? I don't know. Uh, let's see. Well, it broke out. It came back at its prior breakout levels. I would wait for it to hit new highs before looking to play it. Again, it is a relatively new issue, so maybe uh, you can give it a little bit of a pass. But I, I, I just I think I'd wait for new highs. O N T Y, O N T Y. Uh, yeah, it's a biotech. My only problem with biotechs is they might be priced for perfection. I don't like the gap down back here, and I don't like this trading back here. So I think I've eliminated this one from my list. Shorter term, though, bro. I hear you, man. It looks pretty good. On a pullback, yeah, it looks great, but never forget to back the chart out. I'd probably pass based on all those bad memories. Too many bad memories in that one. How about Z? All right, let's take a look at Z. Uh, we should mess with these guys down there. We should taunt them a second time. Who asked about this? We're gonna have what? What's no? We got to bring up Nicholas today. Too many times. Uh, Z, are you kidding me? Let's draw a line here and let's count the months. Okay, y'all help me. One, two, three, four, five, five and a half months of no forward progress. So let's complete the arrow. Uh, no, absolutely not. O N T Y. We talk about that one. Now I don't I don't want to beat you guys up too much. Don't feel don't worry about asking. Just don't ask about the same one twice. That goes sideways. Yeah, we talked about that one. Okay. Uh, do you use ETFs like NUGT on occasion? Okay. Uh, the problem with NUGT, easy for me to say, is um, that it is uh, triple leveraged. So be super careful unless you're going to do something like a like a crazy, excuse my French, Carol, crazy ass day trade at these triple leverage things. I would still steer clear of them. But here's a five minute chart. It, maybe if you're playing a five minute chart, play a little pullback on a five minute chart or something, knock yourself out. But uh, I wouldn't hold them overnight. Okay. Every now and then I'll put them on a momentum list just for fun. But those aren't real dollars that are going into that momentum list. Um, I'm just looking to capture maybe a short-term move out and get leveraged to get leveraged in a sector like gold maybe. Uh, but, yeah, be careful holding them longer term. They're just going to have an abysmal tracking error. Now, I do like GDXJ, and that's a little bit different animal. Uh, that's not leveraged, and that's a great proxy to get you into these uh, lower-tiered gold stocks. So, uh, as far as ETFs, uh, pick your spots carefully with ETFs. I'm not a huge fan, although I do like occasionally like something like the GDXJ, uh, JO, something like a commodity-related ETF like that is fine. Uh, GLD, if you look at it, gets exposure to the commodity, but you're much better off trading the underlying uh, securities when it comes to gold. Okay. Wow, I'm having so much fun. We're almost we're like overtime. Uh, PRTS for Mr. Craig. PRTS, oops, PRTS. Uh, no, it's it's well, of course it's got this one crazy bar way back here. It's too thin. It would have to break out the new highs decisively and pull back, but it's way too thin. Oh, you welcome, Carol. All right, Harold, have a good uh, night. RFMD, let's just wipe out one more two. RFMD. Yeah, the question is about meat. Uh, no, this would. Um, Notice how it kind of broke out, and now it's kind of losing steam in here. So I like it to do just the opposite. I mean, I guess you could look at it like this and like that. 
but if you look at this, it's only like one big bar here. It's just gotten a little squirrely. Uh, I think I'd pass on this one. And then let's take a look at uh, meat, and we'll have to wrap it up. I actually got asked a lot about this. I've actually got a few emails on this one. Is it too volatile? Uh, yeah, it's really kind of volatile. So, But just know the nature of the beast. Uh, but it does look kind of interesting that it's bottomed out in here. It's beginning to rally. Longer term, kind of wide and loose. But for the most part, yeah, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of wild and loose and crazy. So be real careful if you go after that one. The quick answer is yes, it's too volatile. But I hear you. It's uh, it's got some acceleration higher. It's off coming off a major bottom. Overall, it does look pretty good. Okay. All right. Uh, we're gonna need to shut things down. Anything unanswered, feel free to shoot me an email. Richard, that one's on my Landry list. I can't talk about that one. But yeah, absolutely. Um, if we don't talk again between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend, and then hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls uh, again next week. Thank you all so much.